I want to revisit what happened in 2019. We had what a, is known as an oak mast, where all the members of the red oak group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. And I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First, it chewed a hole for its head. Uh, then it forced its head through that hole. And then it forced its entire body through that little hole. It was a tight squeeze. Kind of looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy. But it finally, finally escaped. This is a very dangerous time for this insect larva because it is good to eat. There are a lot of things that are after it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface. It goes down in about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber converts itself to a pupa. And it stays in that chamber as a pupa for two years. After two years comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule. And the mouth parts are way down here. They take those mouth parts, they chew a hole down into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in it. And that is how the larva gets down there. We might wonder why they spend two years underground. Why don't they come out the very next year? Uh, it's because red oak acorns take 18 months to complete their development. So if they come out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Of course, after they leave the acorn, that leaves a hole, a true vacuum. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives within the hole made by acorn weevils when they leave the acorn. And if the ants find a new hole, they get excited because their old acorn is falling apart. So they tell everybody it's time to move the colony. They grab the, the larvae, they grab the eggs. They work very hard and they, they move the entire colony into the new acorn in about 30 minutes. Then they post a guard, make sure nobody else uh, gets in there. And that's where they will live for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. What's my point? That is simply one of, of literally millions of uh, very specialized interactions between, mostly between animals and plants that make up most of nature. This is another one. Uh, this is the relationship between jays and oaks. Jays are the primary disperser of, of acorns. They'll take an acorn and fly up to a mile from the parent tree, tap it beneath the surface of the soil, and then the eye duct is they're gonna, they're gonna go get it and have something to eat during the winter time. But they only remember where they put one in four acorns. So each jay in the fall ends up planting literally thousands of, of new uh, oak trees. The relationship between witch hazels and their pollinators is very specialized, specialized. Witch hazels bloom late in the fall, and it turns out that there's a group of moths called winter moths. The bicolored sallow is one of them that are the primary pollinators of witch hazel, and they do it at night. So it's a long time before we figured that out. Uh, the relationship between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants is very specialized. Carpenter ants are what they rear their young on. So you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have lots of carpenter ants, and you won't have carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have this plant, facilia, because that is the only pollen that that bee can rear its young on. And it turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our, our native bees. We have about 4,000 species of native bees and over a third of them can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plants. So for example, around here, there are at least 13 species of bees that can only reproduce in the pollen of perennial sunflowers. You won't have Baltimore checker spots unless you have white turtle head. I could talk all night long about nature specialized relationships. The problem though is today, these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take ready Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon and he, he stood on the edge, looked out over its wonderful view, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Problem, of course, is that we can't leave the country as it was today because we haven't. It's only about 5% of the, the lower 48 states that's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. <clears throat> We've grazed it. We've got over 770 million acres of rangeland, which is four and a half times the size of Texas. And of course, we paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. 
We have polluted our skies and changed our, our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents. Many of them are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to support the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. Why have we done all that? Well, I'm not sure, but I suspect we thought that, that our, the earth, our nest, was so big we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course, we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing pretty scary headlines like this. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? I'm talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America has lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years, almost a third of our, our North American bird population gone. And now the UN says, well, we're gonna lose a million species to extinction, probably in the next 20 years. And I love the way they, they report this, as if it's an option. Uh, they might as well say, we're gonna lose oxygen in the next 20 years and then go on to the next headline as if it doesn't matter. This is, a, is not an option, folks. We have to make sure this does not happen. Well, I can go on talking about the, the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, and thus upon all of our houses. But that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the risks of life on earth? Well, uh, the great E.O. Wilson, Harvard Emeritus at this point, but uh, clearly the most famous entomologist ever, told us what it would mean if we, if planet Earth lost insects. And he did it way back in 1987 in this paper called The Little Things That Run the World. His message was very clear. He said, life as we know it depends on, on insects. And if insects were to disappear, so would most of the flowering plants. And if most of the flowering plants disappeared, that would, that would, so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial habitats that the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, and the mammals would all collapse and our animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. Good news is that uh, that doesn't have to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're gonna to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, remember humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on nature. We're de dependent on, on nature's life support systems. We call them ecosystem services that support us and everything else on the planet. Uh, this is what plants deliver. How about oxygen? Pretty important. Clean water, equally important carbon capture, tremendously important in today's world. Plants are, are taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, building their tissues with that carbon, and then pumping the extra carbon through their roots into the, into the soil. The soil around us is brown or black because of carbon that plant roots have deposited there over the eons. Plants build topsoil and hold it in place. They prevent floods, they dampen severe weather, they convert sunlight into food, and if we didn't have plants, we'd have to eat sunlight without them. And that'd be pretty hard. What do, what do animals do for plants? Well, they provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today it's actually a, a downright terrible idea. We need more ecosystem services today than ever before because we've got more people today. We've got 7.8, 7.9 billion people on the planet. Taking huge areas of the earth out of production for a status symbol is just not a good idea. Now, there have been, been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet earth. And Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the uh, uh, 1900s. One of the things he said is that the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. There have been indigenous groups that have been good at doing that for a while, but our huge uh, Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually go uh, to a place and take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely wrecking that place. Moving on to another place, doing the same thing. 
wrecking one place after another, clearly not sustainable behavior. So Aldo had had a, a dream. He had this, this hope that we humans were actually capable of developing what he called a land ethic. He knew that we had to use the earth. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all those things. Uh, but he believed that we could learn to do them gently enough that we didn't destroy local ecosystems and then all those services that keep us alive. And that's what he called the land ethic. He wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac. What he didn't write about, though, was, was uh, developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time was so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have even recognized it as an option. What I want to argue this evening, though, is that living with nature not only is an option, it is now the only viable option that's left to us. You know, in the past, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head. We need to conserve nature, save it, rebuild it, really, in all the places we've dismantled it, where there are a lot of people, because that's pretty much every place. In other words, we now have to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, not get smaller every day, but thrive. Where are we going to start? Let's go back to private property. If we don't do conservation on private property, we're going to fail. And that's because most of the, most of the land is privately owned. 85.6% of the U.S. east of the Mississippi is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. So we've got to do conservation on this, 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 this uh, type of land or we're going to fail. We'll be working on areas that are too small and too isolated from each other to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. There are a number of, of conservation options, though, that we're currently not taking advantage of. How about power and pipeline rights of ways? There are 21 million acres in that type of landscape. Railroad rights of ways, another 3 million acres. Road sites, another 17 million acres. Golf courses, 2 million acres. Airports, 3 million acres. You know, the Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. These are big places. Then we have all the places where we live, both in rural areas, suburbs, our cities, hundreds of millions of acres in those landscapes. We could be doing conservation a lot better than we are right now in all of those areas. And if you add them up, that's 599 million acres. How big is 599 million acres? It's big. It's bigger than Vermont, plus New Jersey, plus Maine, Virginia, New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, Montana, California, even throw Texas in there. Not having a place to do conservation is not the issue. We do conservation almost anywhere. <clears throat> when I talk about conservation, I'm not using the word correctly. We certainly want to conserve the nature that's left, but we've dismantled it in too many places. We have to put that back together again. Uh, so it's, it's restoration, but we're, it's not going to be exactly the way it was before we wrecked it. Uh, so a lot of people say, I can't use the word restoration. All right, use whatever you word, word you want. But we're going to reunite enough of these specialized interactions that comprise nature so that we can have functional ecosystems again, even if it's not exactly what was at that particular place before we wrecked it. There are um, critical, critically important building blocks in any ecosystem that we can't ignore. Uh, so we have to start with those first. One group that is essential would be the flowering plants and the pollinators that allow those flowering plants to reproduce. It's flowering plants that are capturing most of the energy from the sun, converting it to food, which they then store in their, their parts, mostly their leaves. So now we have the energy from the sun as food stored in leaves, but you're not gonna have any animals unless you get that energy from the plants to the animals. Most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. They eat something that ate plants. And it turns out that something is typically insects and not just any insect. Caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So when we're restoring nature, we've got to build landscapes that support a lot of caterpillars or we will have failed food webs. Uh, here's an example from the Carolina chickadee. That's the chickadee that we have around here. Uh, they, of course, are the birds that are at our feet or all winter long eating seeds. People think, well, that's what chickadees need. 50% of their diet in the wintertime is seeds. The other 50% is insects. But when they're reproducing, their babies can't eat seeds. So they switch entirely to insects. And if they're in a healthy environment, they will rear their young entirely on 
caterpillars. And it turns out the chickadees are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial bird species in North America rear their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? Uh, well, there are a number of studies that suggest that, but this, this is uh, one that one of my recent students did, Ashley Kennedy. She, uh, it was a citizen science project. She put out a call for bird photographers to take pictures of, of uh, birds during the breeding season when they were carrying prey to the nest. Uh, and then send those pictures to Ashley. She was going to identify what the prey items were. The object was to rebuild or, or, or uh, understand what the nestling diet is for as many bird species as she could in North America. And you're looking at her results. These are the nestling diets of 20 of the common bird families where she had enough data. And the, the green bars are the percentage of those nestling diets that were caterpillars. So in 16 out of the 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, imagine what would happen if we if we designed landscapes that didn't have enough caterpillars. Most of our birds would not be able to reproduce. So something special about caterpillars, what is it? There's actually several things special about caterpillars. And one of them is that uh, they're soft. Think of this guy as if he's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The sausage is, is uh, of course, that's the caterpillar. The wrapper is its exoskeleton. It's made of chitin. It's undigestible. And birds don't want a lot of that. And because the caterpillar is soft, you can stuff it down the throat of your baby without fear of injuring it. And if you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, they're pretty rough. Their beak is like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items when medium-sized caterpillars equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Now, a lot of our birds do chase uh, aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious. They're very high in fat, very high in protein, very low percentage of chitin compared to many other uh, insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible. Uh, and a lot of beetles have, have sharp edges. And finally, caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate, and you're a vertebrate, and birds are vertebrates. And we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids, so we have to get our carotenoids from plants. And we have to get them from plants because they are essential components of vertebrate diets. And that's why my, my wife, Cindy, makes sure that I, I have lots of carrots. So I get my beta carotene, lots of tomatoes. So I get my lycopene, lots of whatever that is. So I get my lutein. And when I eat those things, they stimulate my immune system. And I can't think of a better time to have a healthy immune system. Carotenoids are antioxidants. They run around our body, protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality, improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about things like this male prothonotary warbler who is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutein's. And he takes those lutein's, he makes pigments out of them, puts them in his feathers. And the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. Where is he getting his carotenoids? From the things he eats, of course. But carotenoid levels are not equal in vertebrate prey items. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of bird prey. Here's the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and the butterflies themselves. They have, don't have that many carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. That's where the carotenoids are. And here's the earthworm way down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So that study and uh, a number of others suggest that uh, caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets. It's looking like they are essential parts of bird diets. So let's just say birds need caterpillars. Next question is how many caterpillars do they need? Is one or two enough or one or two a day enough? Well, let's go back to chickadees. Uh, a lot of data on chickadees. <clears throat> how many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. It takes thousands. 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get one nest of chickadees to the point where they fledge, depending on the number of chicks in the, in the nest. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 21 days, but they're flying all around so nobody can count them. So you're really talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to make a clutch of, of birds that weigh a third of an ounce. That's, that's uh, four pennies worth of, worth of bird. And if you want chickadees breeding in your yard, and we do because in so many places, that's all that's left. You have to have all those caterpillars in your yard. 
because the chickadee only forages 50 meters from the nest. He's not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if we design landscapes that don't produce all those caterpillars, that's called uh, uh, insect decline. And it's really looking like that is directly related to the bird declines that people are reporting. We went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al. That's the group that said we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the terrestrial birds up into two groups, the species that require insects at some part of their life history and the species that don't. Things like doves and finches that can reproduce on seeds. Well, the seed eaters uh, didn't lose any numbers in the last 50 years, but the, the species that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. It doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly is suggestive that as insects decline, so do birds. So I'm concluding uh, in an abundance of caution, <coughs> using a little COVID language there, we need to start landscaping with a different goal. In the past, we've landscaped solely for the purpose of producing beautiful landscapes. Uh, and if anything came to eat those beautiful landscapes, we thought, you know, we thought uh, plants were just decorations. Um, well, we, we killed those things and we have we have beautiful but dead landscapes. We now need to make beautiful but living landscapes, and we can only do that by having landscapes that support insects, primarily caterpillars. How do we do that? We add caterpillars to your landscapes by adding the plants that support them. That makes sense. Doesn't seem too hard, but there is a catch, and that is that most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars. Uh, so we have to be fussy about which plants we choose, and we have to be fussy about which plants we choose because the caterpillars themselves are fussy. There's the monarch butterfly, a perfect example. You can have all the calorie pear and all the boxwood and all the burning bush and all the all the the uh, um, uh, all those Asian plants that we we uh, landscape with, the crepe myrtle and the ginkgos, all of those guys, and you won't make a single monarch butterfly. The only thing that's going to create new monarch butterflies is milkweed. That's called host plant specialization. It turns out most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Why? Because plants have made them specialize. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their tissues with nasty tasting chemicals. Secondary metabolic compounds that make those, those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there right now. It's not because there are no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of those plants. They are too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Every plant lineage that's out there protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. And an insect species can't adapt to all of them. So they pick one or two that are really similar to each other and they develop these specialized adaptations that allow them to circumvent those adaptations. The enzymes, allow them to store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, the behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize their exposure to those compounds. But it takes a long period of evolutionary history interacting with those plants for those adaptations to, to fall into place. It doesn't happen overnight. And when they do fall into place, the insect is locked into eating that particular plant lineage. So right now the monarch is locked into eating, eating milkweed. You can, you know, you can, Take away the milkweed and put in any other plant and the monarch will not switch, it'll disappear. And that's why when we bring in plants from other continents, our insects can't eat them. They haven't been here long enough. Nobody has specialized on them. So all I'm trying to say is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to rebuild the food webs that support the life around us in the landscape where we've destroyed those food webs, we got to choose the right plants or it's not going to work. And I'm going to give you three examples of how well it does work when you do choose the right plants, starting with our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. Uh, we bought a, a section of a farm that was, was uh, broken up uh, not that long ago. It was a very old farm, been farmed almost three, 300 years. The soil was exhausted. The last thing they did before they sold the farm was to mow it for hay. Well, you know, when you mow for hay around here, you're really mowing the rootstocks of, of all the invasive plants from China that have escaped our gardens. That's how they got there. The multiflora rose and the oriental bittersweet and the Japanese honeysuckle and the bush honeysuckle and the autumn olive and the miscanthus and on and on and on. You mow that and you call it hay. 
So when we started to build the house, the mowing stopped and that's what came back from all those rootstocks. We had 10 acres of heavily invaded um, Asian vines and plants. And there's no way we could restore the biodiversity on this property unless until we got rid of these, these invasive plants. That's uh, Cindy, she's getting ready to do exactly that. She has done exactly that. <clears throat> she's gotten rid of, she's cleared the, the 10 acres. So if you have an invasive plant problem and if any, most people with any size property do, don't give up. You, you can get ahead of these things. It is a lot of work. Fortunately, she enjoyed doing it. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, she's outside right now, making sure nobody snuck back in there. Um, what was I doing while she was, she was doing all this hard work? Well, I, was, I was telling her she was doing a great job. But I also, it was my job to put the plants back. The object, of course, was to, again, rebuild the biodiversity on this, this farm. Uh, and the only way you can do that is to rebuild the food web. And the only way you can do that is to put the plants in to support the caterpillars that are the basis of that food web. So here's how it went. Uh, I, I wanted to attract the Canadian outlet, just as an example. That's a Canadian outlet. I'd never even seen a Canadian outlet. But, uh, and that's what the adult looks like, looks just like a leaf. In order to have Canadian outlets, you have to have meadow root. Uh, we didn't have any meadow root. No meadow root anywhere around here. The entire area was farmed to death. Uh, so I got some meadow root seeds from someplace and, and planted them and they grew very nicely. Of course, meadow root used to be here hundreds of years ago. Um, but, you know, this was early on and I, I, uh, I really didn't have very much faith that Canadian outlets would be able to find my little patch of, of meadow root. Maybe they had to come all the way from Canada. I don't know. So I didn't even go out and, and check my meadow root for, oh, it must have been two months after I planted it. And I walked by for some other reason and there were Canadian outlets all over my meadow root. So they had found it right away. So now we have a, a good population of meadow root and Canadian owlets. I'm still surprised they found it so, so well. So we've added two species to the property. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. This is a misnomer. This beautiful moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's Aristosa. People call it ditch daisy. I did know where, where uh, there were some Biden's. Uh, in a power line cut in Bear, Delaware. So I got some seeds, planted them. They grew very nicely. Well, it took a year for the, the uh, moth to show up and start to use my Bidens. Um, and now we have a good population of, of both the goldenrod stowaway and, and uh, ditch daisy. So now we've added four species to the property. I wanted to get the hackberry emperor here, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly, but because it's a butterfly that belongs here. It's part of the fauna that used to live here. Well, as its name suggests, it's a specialist on hackberry. We didn't have any hackberry, so we planted hackberry. We had to wait four years for the butterfly to find our hackberry, but it finally did. Uh, a year ago, I walked by one of my, my hackberry branches. I guess it's time to do it again. Uh, and counted the hackberry emperor butter, uh, butterfly caterpillars on a single branch. There were nine of them on a single branch. So another big success. We've added six species to the property. And that's how it went. We did not plant goldenrod, it came in on its own. And along with it came uh, the things that, that require goldenrod, like the brown hooded outlet, the arcigera flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaginothus, the goldenrod gall moth. This is one that hasn't come, the goldenrod flower moth. I don't know why it hasn't come, um, but this is part of the fun. That's what its caterpillars look like. <clears throat> it's anticipation. Every year, it's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year I go out and check my, my uh, goldenrod. I hope to find these caterpillars. Hasn't happened yet, but it's gonna happen one of these years and that'll be a great day. I planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. Um, I hear people don't like Virginia creeper, but I don't know why. It's a great native plant. Has good, good fall color. <clears throat> it, can, it can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down. Makes uh, really nutritious berries for our birds in the fall. Uh, it's actually an excellent pollinator plant, even though its, it's flowers are small and, and they're not attractive to humans. Remember, when you're planting a pollinator garden, you're not planting it for humans, you're planting it for bees. So think like a bee. They love these flowers. And it turns out it is the, the best uh, host plant for some of the large uh, uh, sphinx moth, big caterpillars that are the principal component of cardinal diets. Like the Pandora Sphinx and its beautiful adult, the Lettered Sphinx, the Hog Sphinx, the Abbot Sphinx, all on Virginia Creeper. Wanted to see if I could get the double-toothed prominent just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. 
I mean, even if you don't like caterpillars, you got to love this guy. Who wouldn't? Well, it's a specialist on elm, particularly American elm. We didn't have any American elm. You know, the elms really got hit hard by the Dutch elm disease, but there are a few at the University of Delaware that did not die. They still produce a lot of seed. I got some of those seeds, planted them at home. Now, that was 19 years ago. Those trees are 80 feet tall now. They grew really well. They're still growing really well. And the caterpillar came right away. Wanted the evening primrose moth because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. <clears throat> we didn't have any evening primrose, so I planted it. Enothera, uh, and the moth came. The, the adult sits in the flowers uh, all day long with its head stuffed in the, in the anthers there. It's very cute. And I planted lots of oak trees. Now, these are just examples of the plants we put back at our house. I want to focus on oaks for a while, though, because they're such important plants. This is the Bedford oak in Bedford, New York. People uh, argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And for some people, that's, you know, that's a problem. I hear, I hear them say, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And, well, if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right, you won't. But if you can enjoy what your oak is doing for your property in terms of rebuilding that food web, you can enjoy your oak right away. And I can say that with confidence because I planted my oaks, most of them as acorns, which means they were free, uh, or two foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. And immediately, they started to attract the, the caterpillars, the moths that support the food web, that bring the birds and, and bring life back to our property. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered uh, moth, the orange headed epicolema, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the, uh, the senior moment caterpillar. I just added this one the other day. That's one of the dagger moths. The uh, lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bugalatrix, the orange patch smoky moth, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks on our property. And they came right away. This is a pin oak that has, has uh, popped its head above the leaves. And here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating those leaves. So you don't have to wait hundreds of years for your oaks to start to contribute to your local food web. They do it right away. This is what our house looks like now. This is my Zoom room, by the way. I'm sitting right up in there right now. I'll show you this picture just to convince you that we're very traditional. We got lawn right here, but we put a lot of plants back. <clears throat> and um, every time I add a new lineage of plant, there's the opportunity for new uh, new species of, of moth specialists to come to our house. And remember, that's the key. You're not going to rebuild your local food web without attracting lots of moths. And four years ago, I decided to start taking pictures of every species of moth I could find on our property. I'm still at it. And I am up to 1,078 species of moths that I have photographed on our, our property. That's more species of moths than all the birds in North America. And we've got 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240 thousandths of the land mass, we've got 40% of all the moths that occur in the entire state. And because so many of these are types of bird food, uh, we have recorded 59 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. And this is actually gonna be 60 now because we've got um, uh, a new species. Um, <laughs> I can't remember anything tonight. A new species is breeding on our, our yard uh, this, this year. And, and as soon as this talks over, I will remember what it is. Why am I telling you all this? Well, this is another headline from last fall. The World Wildlife Fund says that, that Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. But I'm thinking not at our house. I am sure we have increased biodiversity by at least two thirds, almost certainly more than that since, and it didn't take that long to do it. And we did it simply by putting the plants back. So it was, it was relatively easy. The reason I'm focusing on this is that, that you see these headlines and everybody wants to just you know, despair. It looks like there's nothing we can do. There's plenty we can do. You put the plants back and life will rebuild itself. These headlines are reversible. But I know what you're thinking. We have 10 acres and a lot of people don't. Will it work on smaller properties? For example, in suburbia. That's a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan, Terp, Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. 
Uh, they have 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than, than Cindy and I have. And they live in a typical development. Um, all their neighbors have big lawns, you know, typical suburban development. Well, when they moved in, their house was, was choked with the common invasive plant there, bush honeysuckle, amur honeysuckle. So the first thing they did was remove that and they put in lots of native plants and then they, they put in a water feature uh, and then sat back and started to count the birds that were using uh, the plants on their property. They're up to 149 bird species that have used their property, including 35 warbler species. Just to put that in perspective, we've only recorded eight warbler species at, at our house. So does it work on smaller properties? Absolutely. What about urban yards though? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, right on the other side of this wall here is one of the runways to O'Hare Airport. Over here is Kennedy Expressway. Pam has one tenth of an acre which is three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. It's a, it's a pretty one-tenth of an acre, but it's not connected to any natural area at all. So it's, it's a little island in Chicago. But she did the same thing. She got rid of her invasive plants, put in 60 species of native plants, a little water feature for the birds. And then she sat back and started to count the birds that have used her one-tenth of an acre. She's up to 120 bird species that have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house in Chicago. What about city centers though? You know, 82% of us live in cities now. Are they gonna miss out on all of this? Well, in 2014, I was staring at this plant, Asclepius tuberosa, call it butterfly weed. Um, that reminds me, you know, we've got a serious marketing issue with our native plants. We call them weeds. I wonder why people don't, don't plant them. So let's not call this butterfly weed. Let's call it Monarch's Delight. Okay, I was staring at Monarch's Delight 2014, and the first thing I saw were two species of leafcutter bee, of megachylid bee, a big one and a small one. I know they're leafcutter bees because they collect their pollen on their tummy, not on their legs. Well, leafcutter bees have very strict requirements. Uh, not only do they need pollen and nectar, but they also need soft leaves, leaves uh, like on, on redbud, because they snip out the edges of those leaves, make little semicircles, roll up those semicircles into a tube, stuff the tube full of pollen, lay an egg on it uh, and seal it up. And then they put that in a crack or a crevice and that is how they reproduce. Uh, well, there was a red bud growing right next to Monarch's Delight. So the leafcutter bees had everything they needed. Of course they were there. Pretty sure that explains why there were bumblebees there as well. Bumblebees over winter is queen. So when they come out in the spring, there aren't any workers to help them. The queen has to do all the work to start that colony. So she needs uh, access to abundant forage, a lot of plants with a lot of nectar and a lot of pollen. And that's exactly what redbud supplies. And then I saw a monarch, actually two monarchs, foraging on Monarch's Delight. Now this was 2014. This was June 2014, which is early to be seeing monarchs this far north. I had gone all of 2013 without seeing a single monarch. That was a low point in the monarch population. Only 3.6% of the monarchs left compared to 1976. So I was, I was encouraged. I mean, gee, maybe the monarchs weren't going to disappear after all. Uh, why were they there? Well, they had monarchs delight. There was another milkweed there as well. I think it's purple milkweed. So they had nectar, but they also had their host plant. They could lay their eggs, everything they needed. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of Manhattan. And that is the strip of nature along the High Line. The High Line, it was an abandoned elevated railroad. It was abandoned for decades. Somebody went up there and looked around. It was loaded with native plants that had planted themselves, was taking care of themselves. So they decided to make it a, a, a tourist destination. Uh, and they did. It's extremely successful. Literally millions of people uh, uh, visit the High Line every year to see this little strip of, of nature. Uh, but uh, that, that doesn't matter. All the things I, I noticed were there uh, anyway. This is Rick Dark. He was always after me to go see the, the uh, beautiful plants on the High Line. Well, I'm not much of a city boy, uh, so I always drag my feet. But, you know, seeing beautiful plants with nothing using them is actually depressing to me. It's, it's not, does not encourage me. And that's what I thought I would see on, on uh, the High Line. I mean, here you are with a little strip of plants 30 feet above the taxis right in the middle of construction. 
what animal is going to go use that? Well, I was completely wrong. Somebody has done a study of the bees that are using the highline right now. There are up to 30 species of native bees that have found their way in there. So I, uh, I, I have changed my tune. I now believe that, that uh, you know, if you use native plantings correctly, you can bring life back to anywhere. If we can do that in Manhattan, we can do it anywhere. There are four uh, things we need to think about if we want to succeed in a big way in terms of uh, conserving nature <clears throat> in our human dominated landscapes. And, and the first thing is we've got to shrink the area that we have in lawn because we have too much lawn. We've got over 40 million acres of lawn and that's a 2005 statistic. So we know it's much more than that. That's an area the size of New England, which is dedicated to a status symbol, which is an ecological deadscape. It, you know, there's, there's nothing living here. And if something's living, we put pesticides on and make sure that it's not. Um, but what if we cut this area in half and put in productive plantings in the other half? We'd still have our manicured lawn. Um, we, could, we could still send the message to our neighbors that, that we are high status uh, and then we can follow the cultural rules. Uh, and it will still be a beautiful landscape, but it will give us, if we replant half the area now in lawn, it'll give us 20 million acres to put towards conservation right where we live. So we'll be able to create a new national park. We call it Homegrown National Park, and it'll be large. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, plus Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So we will have the largest national park in the country. What do you get when you put some part of nature right where you live? You get the opportunity to develop a personal relationship with the natural world. You could do it at your own time and your own pace. All you have to do is go outside. You can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, there, there are millions of people there. There's no admission fee, it's free. It's never closed no matter what pandemic comes down the pike. No travel hassles. You get to experience the natural world alone. And I don't know how you're gonna develop a personal relationship with that world and if it's mediated by somebody else. You really have to work it out on your own. And this is particularly important for our kids. Richard Lou says our kids are suffering from nature deficit disorder. A lot of evidence to support that. So we're trying, we get 30 kids and put them on a bus with a teacher and they drive for an hour to a natural place and they walk around and the teacher tells them not to touch anything. Then they get back in the bus and they go home and that's their exposure to the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing, but it's really been an exposure to 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have nature right in their yard, all they have to do is go outside alone, no parental supervision, let them establish that relationship the way it works for them, which is so important because if they don't have a relationship with the natural world, uh, these are the future stewards of our planet. They're gonna be lousy stewards. They won't even know what they're supposed to be stewarding or why. And maybe they will learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii on a very modest piece of nature, a little patch of grass and a hedge. Uh, but there are anole lizards there. Uh, and so she sent me this picture to, to tell me how you hunt lizards. You get on the ground, you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards don't see you coming. And then you crawl very slowly toward the lizard. No smiling. This is serious business. You can wear your best dress. That's okay. But you, you crawl up on them. You sneak up on the lizard. You, you catch it. You put it in an aquarium. You learn how to take care of it. And you've got that personal relationship with that part of the natural world. Now, I don't think Zoe's going to be crawling on the ground in her best dress catching lizards the rest of her life. I don't think. She sent me this picture the other day, so who knows. But I guarantee she's going to remember catching lizards in Hawaii for the rest of her life. And I also guarantee it's going to help her be a, an excellent steward of the planet. If you want to do more, if you want your kids to do more than, than catch lizards, get Nancy Stranisti's uh, Nature Play at Home. Uh, outlines dozens of ways that your kids can, can interact with nature right where they live. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, go to homegrownnationalpark.org. It's our, our new website and get yourself on the map. Uh, all that means is you're going to uh, put where you live, your, your uh, location in your county on the map <clears throat> and the amount of area that you have converted or are planning to convert to, to uh, 
putting in uh, the native plants that support the life around you. Um, this is our attempt at, at social media. You know, I've been talking to the choir for 15 years, uh, but we need to get to uh, all the people who don't have any idea that their little piece of the earth is a really important uh, part of, of the future of conservation. Uh, so there's no no admission fee. Nobody's nobody's really a member here. Uh, we want to unite all the people in the National Wildlife Federation, all the people in Audubon, all the people in the Sierra Club, all the people in no club at all to join up and and convert 20 million acres of lawn to the natural world. And we can watch it happen on the map. OK, we're going to shrink the lawn. What plants should we put in the area that that uh, was once lawn? Some of them have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. What's a keystone plant? Remember what a, what a keystone is. This is the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of the arch. And if you take that stone out, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses because keystone plants are making most of the food. Just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the, of the keystone plants in your yard as the two by fours in the ecological house that you're, you're building. That's what's going to hold the house up. You can't build a house out of wallpaper. But that's you're not through building your house when you put those those plants in. So they're essential, but they're not the only things you're going to put in your yard. So the question is no longer simply are natives better than non natives in terms of supporting the life around you. On average, they certainly are. But there are a lot of natives that don't support a whole lot of, of life either. Um, that's the important point here. So we've got to focus on the ones that support most of the, the life. They're really the hyperproductive plants. They're better than the, the benign ones and much better than the ecologically destructive plants. Those Asian uh, ornamentals that have become invasive, like our burning bush, like the barberry, like uh, a porcelain berry, like calorie pear. Those things, if you go into, uh, if you go into, um, uh, you know, any of the natural areas around here, they're just choking uh, all of those natural areas, ecologically castrating the, the land around us. I get an email once in a while from, from somebody that says, uh, don't I know that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from Asia, actually grew in North America 7 million years ago. That makes them native. That means we can plant them and everything will be great. Well, yes, I do know that ginkgos grew in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native today. But I'm not going to have that argument because, because that's not the metric anymore. It's not whether they're native or not. It's whether they're doing anything or not, whether they're productive. I don't care if ginkgos grew in the moon 7 million years ago. They produce zero species of caterpillars today. They are not supporting the food web. <clears throat> What's supporting the food web better than anything else? Oaks. <clears throat> in 84% of the counties in which they occur, oaks are the number one keystone plant. In the mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species of caterpillars, over 950 species nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. This is an example of, of the role the keystone oaks are playing in our yard here. Now, so far, I've taken pictures of 1,078 moss species. Haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. I will. Out of the 1,078 species, only 945 have known host plants. So there's there's uh, you know about 130 that we don't know what they're eating at this point. Out of that 945, though, 280 species use oaks. And we've got 69 genera of native woody plants on our property. Only one of them is the genus Quercus, the oaks. We have hundreds of genera of herbaceous plants. So oaks represent less than 1.5% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our total plant diversity, but they're supporting almost 30% of our moss species diversity. Imagine what would happen if we took uh, oaks out of the landscape. The biodiversity would crash. How do you find out what the keystone plants are? Where you live, you go to Native Plant Finder on the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your, your zip code on the ranked list of uh, both woody and herbaceous plants that are best at supporting the caterpillars in your county will pop up. These are just examples of what a typical list will look like. Uh, and I stopped just because I ran out of, of room, not because these are total lists. But uh, in most places, oaks will be number one, followed by our native cherries, our native willows. Blueberries are always very high. Birches are high. Um, notice I say native cherries, native willows. If I go to the nursery and say, I want to buy a cherry, 
they're going to sell me an Asian cherry, an Asian flowering cherry. If I want to buy a willow, they'll sell me a weeping willow from Turkey. If I want to buy a birch, it'll probably be a European birch or a maple be a Japanese maple. Specify that you want a native species that belongs to, to these native genera. Because if you get a non-native species, uh, it's going to support 65% fewer caterpillars and you won't accomplish the goal. These are the top herbaceous plants uh, in most counties. Goldenrods way up there are the genera that asters were broken up into way up there. Sunflowers uh, way up there. With those three genera alone, you can support over 40 species of native specialist bees and hundreds of species of caterpillars. Why do we care about the specialist bees? Because the generalist bees can use those plants as well. But if we only plant for the generalist bees, the things like uh, honeybees and, and uh, bumblebees, you lose all the specialist bees. So if you have, if you have goldenrods and asters and, and perennial sunflowers in your year, you can support over 40 species of, of specialist bees. That won't be there if you have other, other plants, but not these. Uh, and if you're from Canada, there's a, a similar web, website up there. Okay, we're going to shrink the lawn. Uh, we're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to invite a lot of insects to our yards, and then we're going to kill them with our security light, which, of course, is not the goal. There's a lot of research that suggests that uh, light pollution at night is one of the major causes of insect declines. Uh, and these are all the ways that, that um, lights kill insects at night. So, you know, this might seem uh, like really bad news, but it's actually good news to me because we have to turn around insect declines. We've got to start increasing insects, make more of them. We've already lost 45% of the insects on planet Earth. They're the things that keep us alive. So if we can increase insect population simply by flicking a switch, just by turning out our lights, and we're getting off easy. That's, that's pretty easy to do. But I know what you're going to say. You can't turn that your garage light off over your garage because if you do, the bad man will come. Or I put a motion sensor on it so that it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to, going to recognize is the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't want to do that, take the, the white bulb out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb. Yellow LED bulbs are the best. Uh, because yellow wavelengths are the least attractive to nocturnal insects. If we switched out our white bulbs for yellow, yellow bulbs overnight, we would save billions of insects and probably billions of dollars too, because uh, of course LEDs are much more energy efficient. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to turn out our lights and then we're going to invite Mosquito Joe to come kill all our insects. We have no end to the way we want to kill all the insects around us. This is a booming business all around the country. Mosquito Joe is single-handedly undoing everything that I've been working on for the last 15 years. He will say, well, this is okay because this is a natural product. It's pyrethroids. <clears throat> and he's right. It's pyrethroids. Uh, it's from chrysanthemums. Uh, but that doesn't make it okay. Cyanide is a natural product, natural product too. So um, I, I wouldn't listen to that. He also says it only kills mosquitoes. And that's not even close to true. I don't know if you saw the headlines last year, last fall where uh, monarchs were migrating and, and uh, they flew through some uh, mosquito fogging operations. It killed hundreds of, of monarchs. Um, so uh, it, it, Mosquito Joe kills all the insects he comes in, in contact with, but he kills mosquitoes very poorly. In order to control mosquitoes, you have to kill 90% of the adult mosquitoes in a population. Mosquito Joe kills between um, 10 and 50%. So it's not even close to actually getting control. If you really want to control mosquitoes, and by the way, he's expensive. So you're paying a lot of money for something that doesn't work. If you really want to control mosquitoes, get a bucket. People say, how big should the bucket be? It doesn't matter. The bigger, the better. Fill it full of water, put in a handful of straw or hay and let it ferment for a couple of days. You're building up the algae and diatom populations in that water, which become irresistible to mosquitoes that want to lay their eggs. The females will lay their eggs in your bucket. You go to the hardware store and get a mosquito dunk. That's a uh, natural bacterium, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. You put one of those discs in your bucket, the mosquito larvae feed on it, and they die. It's very, very uh, targeted. If a dragonfly gets in there, it doesn't hurt it. If a, uh, a bird drinks your water or your dog likes it, doesn't hurt it a bit. So it's targeted, it's cheap, and it works. The fourth thing we need to do is to build landscapes that allow caterpillars, those things that are driving our food webs, to complete their development. What do I mean by that? 
Well, I live in Chester County where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from one of the branches, then it emerges as an adult, and then it does it all over again. Well, I wish everything did that, but most things don't. 480 species, 94% of the caterpillars on oaks, and this is true for, for the other trees that are out there, drop from the tree after they finish growing and wiggle their way beneath the ground if the soil's loose enough, and they pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that is under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. And you know that we, we landscape like this everywhere. And we mow and compact the soil under our, our trees so that the, the ground is too hard for the caterpillars to get underground and pupate. So this, this becomes an ecological trap. The moths come in and they, they uh, lay their eggs and the caterpillars grow and they drop down and then they die. I am convinced that this is another major cause of insect declines around the world. And of course, the cement landscape is even less of a viable option for caterpillars. This is what most people do. You have a big tree in a yard. Nobody's measured. We're actually doing it this summer. The success of caterpillars in a lawn situation like this. Uh, but I guarantee that it's going to be better in a layered landscape like this, where you have a tree and maybe a dogwood and then a native azalea and ferns and ground cover. Caterpillar drops down to a safe site. The soil is not compacted. It can easily get beneath the, the soil. Uh, or can spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's down there. Survivorship is going to be much higher. This is where you can put your, uh, your fancy spring ephemeral gardens, right next to your trees. This is how you shrink your lawn. Put beds, flower beds, right next to your trees. Make them as big as you can. Then you'll have less lawn. Safe sites. This is where you should use your, your uh, native ground covers, things like wild ginger or, or may apple or foam flower or ferns. This is Athens, Georgia, a hotel in Athens, Georgia. These are red maples. Any caterpillar developing on here can drop down into a safe site, even though it's the middle of a city. So we can do a whole lot better with how we landscape under our trees and improve the survivorship of those moths that all those birds need. Uh, another one of my grad students, uh, Desiree Narango. Of course, these people have left at this point. Did some wonderful research with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, DC. And one of the things she found is that uh, there's actually room for compromise in our plant choices. And that's good news to me. What she did was, was look at how well chickadee populations could be sustained in landscapes that were dominated by native plants versus landscapes dominated by introduced plants. And the first thing she found is when the landscapes were dominated by introduced plants, they produced 75% fewer caterpillars. So we reduced the amount of bird food by 75%. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. If the chickadees came, there were, there were uh, nest boxes there, but they looked around, they said, well, there's, there's not enough uh, food here. We're not even gonna try. If they did try, those nests contained 1.5 fewer eggs. They were 29% less likely to survive at all. They produced 1.2 fewer fledglings if they did survive. And it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. And you might say, well, those aren't huge differences, but if you put all that, that uh, information into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plant biomass in your yard, from none to 100%, this is what you get. We focus on woody plant biomass because that's where chickadees forage. They're not foraging on the ground. This dotted line is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies in order to replace the adults that die every year. If you reproduce at this rate, that's a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, you have a growing population. But if you make fewer babies, you've got a shrinking population. Unsustainable. This is where, generously speaking, where those lines overlap which means you can have up to 30% of your woody plant biomass in your yard non-native without destroying your local food web. In other words, 70% of your, your woody plant material should be native. Now, out of that 30%, you can't have uh, any invasives, no calorie pears, no, no burning bushes, no porcelain berry. Um, but you can have your ginkgo, you can have your crepe myrtle, you can have your forsythia, the things that aren't moving around without destroying the local food web, as long as they don't dominate your landscape. And to me, this is really good news, because if my message was you couldn't have any non-native plants without wrecking everything, um, nobody would listen. We love our non-native plants. Remember, it's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of native plants.
if we if we put more of these back, uh, we can tolerate a lot of these. Can we use native plants in formal landscapes? Of course we can. I got this uh, slide the other day from from Lynn O'Shaughnessy. She designed this this garden. You don't get more formal than that. This was taken from a drone, by the way, about 400 feet. It's a big garden. Every plant in that garden is a native plant. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the, the uh, plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe every day. And I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a, a pollinator garden into a, a suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can put a little fence around it. It formalizes it. It sends the message, this is planned. You're helping the bees with a lot of diversity here. It's not very big, it could be bigger, uh, but if everybody did it, it would be a whole lot more forage for the bees out there than we have right now. Remember why we need pollinators. You hear all the time we need them because they, they pollinate our agriculture, 30% of our agriculture. It's actually about 12% of our agriculture. But you know, then people say, well, I don't live next to a farm. I don't need any pollinators. That's the danger with that, that uh, reasoning. Forget agriculture. We need pollinators because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the, on the planet. Not an option. Where do we need pollinators? Every place we need plants, which is every place. How about this design, a Drew Latham design? <clears throat> Imagine the amount of life that is supported here versus the amount of life that's supported here. It's a no brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Yes, they can, and more and more of them are doing it. Uh, Minnesota kicked off uh, a land, uh, a cost sharing program to encourage homeowners to replace some or all of their lawn with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. They call it the Lawn to Legume program. Very successful. A lot of people, they, they, you know, the state pays you to do that. Pennsylvania, I didn't know this, Pennsylvania uh, has a lawn conversion program. Uh, it's young, it's only two years old, but you can get up to $5,000 per acre of lawn that you convert to native plantings. It was designed to help uh, watershed management, which is great because it's going to help biodiversity at the same time. Florida, there's an uh, island off of Florida that is paying residents to allow burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written. With, with carrots rather than sticks. If you've got an endangered species on your property, we're gonna pay you to take care of it rather than fine you if you use your property for some reason. Everybody would want an endangered species on their property. Um, uh, St. Louis, Missouri and, and uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas have a uh, uh, bounty on calorie pears, on Bradford pears. You take out a calorie pear, you get a free tree replacement. And even uh, public utilities are getting into the act. In San Antonio, you get a $100 coupon to, to put in water efficient native plants and get rid of the water inefficient non-natives. And the very successful lawn conversion programs in California, they don't have the water folks. So take out your, your lawn, put in Xeric plantings and you get up to $2 per square feet rebate. Well, I think we made three missteps in the early years of conservation. The first one's a serious one. Somehow we came to think that, that nature was optional. You know, it's nice, we'd like to have it around, but if it disappears, that's okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. Nature is essential. If we think it's optional, when resources are in short supply, what do you think is gonna take a back seat? Nature will always lose that. And, and resources are always in short supply, by the way. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out and there was this wall sized poster um, which to me epitomizes uh, our society's view of conservation. We want to save wildlife, we want to save nature for, for future generations to enjoy. That was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for creating the national park system. We want to save these beautiful places so that future generations can enjoy them and, and, and appreciate them. And I, I get that, and they certainly do, but it suggests nature's there just for entertainment. No wonder we don't think it's essential. Entertainment is not essential but nature is essential. We need to save nature, not so we can entertain it, but, but so that we have future generations. It's a little bit more urgent. Secondly, we've assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. Now we talked about this, but if we restrict conservation just to areas where there's not a lot of humans, we're gonna fail because those, those areas are too small and too isolated from each other to sustain the nature that we need. 
David Quammen has a uh, an analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. That's not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, each one of which is, is not functioning like a Persian rug. And this is, of course, uh, what we have done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance, which implies there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, even our yards, even our corporate landscapes, even our roadsides, even much of our agriculture. So we need to glue our rug back together again, folks not just to build biological carters so that plants and animals can move back and forth between viable habitats, but to produce viable habitats where we've totally destroyed them right, right now. In other words, we're gonna put the plants back where we live, where we work, where we play, where we farm. We're going to, for the first time in modern history, coexist with the natural world. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship just to a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, a few ecologists, for some reason, we didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet. But I don't know why, because everybody on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystem. So why wouldn't everybody bear the responsibility of good Earth stewardship? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said that the, the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with those mindsets, you're taught them. We're good at teaching this one. We have been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers their obligations to stewarding planet Earth. That doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. So many of us today feel, feel powerless. You know, the Earth's problems are huge. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn, one person can get rid of their invasive plants, one person can put in a pollinator garden, one person can use keystone plants, one person can totally uh, reinvigorate the ecosystem in their yard and, and enhance their local ecosystem rather than degrade it. And it also shrinks the problem down to something manageable for each one of us. Don't think of the of the of uh, all the Earth's problems um, as if something you've got to solve. Just worry about your little piece of the Earth. If you own property, that's obvious. That's where you're going to start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Volunteer for a land conservancy, a park, or preserve. They're all underfunded, all understaffed. They'll love you. So as property owners or as volunteers, each one of us has the power, and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own fate. So I think I've convinced my grandkids that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Doug. That was fantastic. You are um, welcome. We have um, just a little bit of time for questions, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Um, I want to look back um, in the comments. There was there was someone wondering how to convince residents that their weed-free lawns are not desirable. I guess that would be to invite them to your talk. <laughs> <laughs> that should um, do it, or you can always give them one of my books. <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of a lot of my talks are up on YouTube. People have put them up there, so. Have a little a neighborhood sit in and everybody watch it together. I don't know. Yeah, I, I know that some um, some worry about you know the aesthetics, and I think that's just something that has to change with time and culturally. We have to you know have some people well, I, willing to push the the bar. Right? Yeah, but um, a lot of people mistakenly think that a, a native landscape is a messy landscape. It doesn't have to be. This is where you can use lawn as a cue for care. The lawn we keep is gonna be manicured. That's not gonna be the place where the biodiversity, we're just gonna have more plants in that, in that yard. So we do wanna do this tastefully, particularly in the front yard. Um, so we don't have to sacrifice aesthetics, we really don't. And that's where that 30% non-native can come in handy. You can, you can have that, that beautiful crepe myr myrtle as an accent plant. It just can't be the only plant on your property. So we can do this, we really can do it. Um, we had a question 
Well, one person, um, Lynn, was saying that the mystery bird on your property is bothering her. <laughs> she was wondering uh, well, I never said orange. that was on my property. That is, uh, that's the hermit warbler from Oregon. We have grandkids that live in Portland, Oregon. I took that picture uh, when we went to visit them. So, <laughs> okay, but that's good. She recognized it was not a, a eastern bird. So, um, someone's asking why do caterpillars have such a bad rap as tree killers? Got me. Well, all right. It's probably from the invasive caterpillars. So things like the gypsy moth and the winter moth and these these any insect we bring in from another country causes huge problems. So I'm not promoting that. Uh, if you have any of these non-native insects, you definitely want to uh, battle them. But the native insects don't kill our trees. Or if they do, it's rarely, you know, a rare circumstance. The yeah. reason the non-natives do is because they don't have any natural enemies. They were brought here without their predators, their parasitoids, or their diseases to control them. Makes sense. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, what would you recommend for a moderately shady yard that is covered with English ivy? <laughs> Step one is to get rid of the English ivy. And this is one of the problems with these ornamental plants. English ivy is a great example of a plant that is really hard to get rid of because everywhere it goes, it lays down little roots. You can do it, but it's a lot of work. Um, it should not be sold in nurseries or you should should uh, hire somebody to do it and send the bill to the nurseryman who sold that to you. They'd stop doing it then, but uh, you can't revitalize your yard until you get rid of those invasive plants. Someone would like to know, Jessica is asking um, that flowers and shrubs get all the attention, but do you have any recommendations for native grasses or sedges that host caterpillars? Yeah. Um, Sure, Pennsylvania sedge, there's a lot of native grasses. Our warm season uh, bunch grasses, uh, so switch grass is one of them, uh, little blue stem, turkey foot. <clears throat> um, those are not substitutes for lawn because they form clumps. You can't mow them effectively, but they're, they're very good. They have great winter uh, appeal because they turn different shades of, of brown and they give structure to your, your yard. And they produce lots of seeds that uh, help the winter birds get through the, the winter. You know, everybody says, well, I put out a bird feeder, but look at who goes to your bird feeder. None of the sparrows do. They're all feeding off the, the ground. Most of the juncos are feeding off the ground. Um, and those native grasses are supplying most of that seed. But uh, all of the skippers feed on, on native grasses and sedges. Uh, that's the, you've got butterflies and moths and skippers is that group in the, in the mean, in the middle there. Our uh, wood nymphs, another group of butterflies feed on grasses. So grasses are very important. Um, I have a question for you. Um, I, I really got into your books actually really with the pandemic. So <laughs> that was one good thing for me that came out of being at home all the time was I was, I was planting a lot of new native plants. Um, but something that came up for me was that I had to adjust my mindset that I was actually feeding wildlife because not only did it feed the, the butterflies, you know, the, the caterpillars, but I was bunnies and deer. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, you know, in our artificial uh, ecosystems, we've gotten rid of the predators. So we have way too many deer. That's not a normal natural situation. And as a matter of fact, the overabundance of deer is, is one of the major causes that we have such a terrible problem with invasive plants because the deer like the native plants, just like the caterpillars. So if an oak tree pops its head up, the deer eats that and it leaves the autumn olive. And when you do that for 50 years, you got nothing but autumn olive. Uh, so too many deer has caused a great, great problem with in that regard. It's given us Lyme disease. Uh, it's given us an overabundance of, of ticks. Um, Rabbits are uh, can be a problem if you you know if you don't have the foxes and things to control them. Usually not as much, but the deer uh, we got to control our deer. Not only that, they're 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 not they're eating all the replacement trees. You know, forests the trees get old, they fall over, but they've got young trees that are in a light gap that grow up and and replace them. Well, the deer eat those young trees, so now there are no replacement understory trees. If you do that for 100 years, and we've already done it for almost 50 years now, you have no forest when all the big trees fall down. 
and we're well on our way to, to that. So, so controlling our deer simply so that we can have our, our, our woodlots is a necessary goal. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to add that not only if someone has a question and they just want to ask it directly, feel free to, um, if you know how to use the reactions, you can raise your hand. Um, so that way I know that you want to speak. Um, feel free to do that as well. But I, I will continue to check the comments too. Robin is asking, is there an opportunity to enlist nurseries in better educating people on biodiversity support plants? Are there some leaders by example in our area? Well, there are native plant nurseries that are leading by example. Uh, you know, the, the various nursery associations have big conventions every year. I've, I'm always talking at them. Um, so this is, this is better known today than it was not that long ago. Um, and, and, you know, what's driving it is, is you folks. If there's a market there, the nursery industry will follow it. They just want to save, sell plants. They don't have any special relationship with China to make sure they're Chinese plants. It's just that those non-native plants are the only ones you bought in the past. But now if, you, if they realize there's a market for native plants, and there is now, uh, most, most people are having trouble keeping them in stock. Um, they say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grow more, more native plants. They just wanna sell plants and you can't blame them for that. So go to the nursery, request your, your favorite native plant. If they don't have it, don't settle for something else. Say, I'll wait till you get it. And if he says, well, I'm never going to get it, then say, okay, I'll see you. Don't buy something else and go someplace else because there are people that are, that are willing to get it for you. That's how we expand the native plant uh, resources. Absolutely. Our money speaks louder than that. It does. It does. <laughs> yeah. Um, Lynn is asking if you have any recommendations for a small balcony planting that would be helpful. Uh, you know, um, Sure, but and not a lot of research has been done on that. Uh, that that's a great opportunity to put in plants that would help pollinators because they're very mobile. You know, they can fly up to your balcony. Uh, I would love to see people uh, get some, you know, maybe large container plants and put in little milkweed patch and and tell me, are the monarchs coming in using it? I bet they would. I've seen it at Mount Cuba Center, you know, in pots right in front of the mansion. They've got Joe Pieweed. So you would call it a weed. It's really Joe Pie. It's beautiful. And all the butterflies are nectaring on, on that. But asters could be, they're wonderful fall uh, uh, nectar producers for migrating monarchs, but all of those, those bees as well. Um, any of your spring ephemerals would do well in, in, in container planting. So um, that's, for, that's more of an unexplored area is, is container plants with native plants and then, you know, uh, monitor the wildlife that actually uses it in different situations. That'd be a great project. Thank you. Um, another question, is there a way to get American elm seeds or seedlings from UD? So I'm assuming University <laughs> of Delaware. <laughs> yeah, you go there in uh, the end of April try to think yeah end of april and scoop them up out of the gutter nobody's collecting them or anything but the, yeah if you know ud at all there's a giant elm uh, right on the side of the library with a parking lot around it seeds fall down and they're just laying there that's that's got to be the best elm in delaware i mean go there and scoop up those seeds and plant them everywhere they germinate in six days little things and by the end of the first year they're almost two feet tall they grow really fast so it's a good idea and by the way, all the seeds I've gotten there, you know, not one of my, my elms has died from Dutch elm disease. So uh, maybe there's not much Dutch elm disease around anymore, or they've got some resistance. Those are the two choices. Great. Um, let's see, does, are there any other questions? Did I miss anything in the chat, which is entirely possible as it, it moves fast sometimes? Um, okay, um, there's someone asking for the link to the Homegrown National Park. I'm happy to share that in an email follow-up. It's just homegrownnationalpark.org, that O-R-G, okay. all one word. Um, someone is asking, how do vegetable gardens contribute? 
Uh, that's something totally different. You know, we want to garden for food locally. So vegetable gardens are a great way to, to use your property, but it's about making food for humans. It's not about supporting wildlife. Uh, your, your native plants around your vegetable garden can help control garden pests. So I'll give you an example. Uh, the tomato hornworm or tobacco hornworm that, that get on your tomatoes, that's a sphinx moth. It's a native sphinx moth. It's got a little, little uh, wasp that parasitizes it. Those white cocoons you see on its back, that's, each one of those has a wasp in it. Uh, and they control that, that uh, big caterpillar. Well, that, that braconid wasp is a specialist on sphinx moths. And it will hit other sphinx moths too. So it, in, in my house, I've got 17 species of sphinx moths. So there's always a population of that moth here. And if the tobacco hornworm comes and gets on the, my tomatoes, that parasitite is, is, is here. It's, it attacks them right away. If you don't have any other sphinx moths around you, then you've got no braconids and your, your uh, sphinx moths will probably defoliate your tomatoes before any parasitoids show up. So it's an example of how uh, rather than your garden helping the wildlife, the wildlife will help your garden. Great. I think um, one more, I'm, st I'm wondering about the best choice native plants for a moderately shady backyard. Um, okay, well, almost any plant will grow in the shade, but flowering plants typically won't flower in the shade. One that does uh, a good job of flowering in the shade that does very well around here is our native hydrangea, hydrangea arborescence. But here's, here's uh, something that's important. If you go to the nursery and say, I want hydrangea arborescence, they'll try to sell you hydrangea arborescence Annabelle. It's a cultivar where the flowers are, the reproductive parts of the flower have been turned into bracts and it makes the, the flower head bigger and showier, but it's completely sterile. So that's a native plant that was excellent for pollinators that you've removed its benefit for pollinators. Um, so say, I want the straight species. Can you get me the straight species? And the answer is yes, they can. They just have to make an effort to do it. <laughs> that's a good one in the shade. Um, all your spring ephemerals are good in the shade because they bloom before the leaves even come out. So they're actually blooming in the sun. Um, uh, uh, white snake root is a good uh, perennial that, that uh, does well in the, the shade. Um, so there are a number of them. You know what? Here, let me, let me recommend this. This is Essential Native Trees and Shrubs for the Eastern United States by Tony Dove and Ginger Woolridge um, that has extensive charts in the beginning that will tell you there you go, extensive charts. Out of all the plants that they cover, it gives you every possible use. So you can look up what does well in the shade, what does well in it wet, when it's in any kind of condition and you get it all outlined here. Um, and so there's a lot of, of resources that do that, including some of my own books, but this does it better. So I, I recommend that one. Wonderful, thank you. And you actually just reminded me of a question that I had forgotten that I wanted to ask, which is, are all cultivars, you know, bad? Like, you know, when I first started, um, you know, reading your material and, and going and trying to look for natives, I ended up buying some, not knowing, because um, it said native on the tag. Right. Um, so what's your thoughts on that? Are they all <laughs> to be you know, avoided we... or some okay and some aren't? Or is that, you know, it's yeah. probably a gray area. It's a gray area. We humans love to make things black or white. It's good or bad, it's good or evil. Most of the time it's neither one. Um, so are cultivars as ecologically productive as straight species is what you're asking. And the question is, it depends on what the genetic change was that created the cultivar. Uh, so uh, for example, hydrangea arborescence, Annabelle, that genetic change destroyed the productivity of the flower. It's prettier. Um, there's a double flower uh, blood root that's, you know, it's prettier, but it has no, no uh, pollinator value. We did a study looking at six traits, uh, not had nothing to do with flowers, but if you make a tall plant short, if you make a, a um, better fall color, or if you enhance berry size, if you introduce disease resistance, those were the types of traits we looked at. And the only one 
that reduced insect use was taking a green leaf and making it red or purple because that loads the leaf with anthocyanins, which are feeding deterrents. So the red leaf cultivars that are so, so popular, um, they do. Uh, I, would, I would put them in the, the bad category if you're trying to enhance local wildlife. The others, not so much. The one thing you should think about with cultivars though is that um, most of them are, are propagated clonally. So there's, there's zero genetic variability. Um, you're selling one genotype and we know that's not a good idea. If a disease comes, it wipes out all of them at the same time. In, in the day of, of climate change, we need as much genetic variability as possible because that's what fuels adaptation. We need our plants to be able to adapt to a more erratic climate. That's what climate change is. And if, if we're only planting cultivars out there, that, that adaptation is probably not gonna happen, so. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much. We're right about at 8.30. So, um, and I think we've gotten to most of the questions or all the questions, I hope. Um, so thank you again so much. This was so informative. There were a lot of question, um, comments that I did not read. If you didn't get a chance to see them, Doug, wonderful presentation, a lot of thank yous, and we hope to pass on this information that we've learned um, and spread the word, so. Wow, that's great. Thanks for listening, everybody. Yep. Thank you. Have All a great right. night, everyone. Bye-bye.